chapter 6. They're going to put this up on the wall there. And uh, uh, last week, I'm actually, whether you believe it or not, I'm kind of building up to something. Last week, I preached on believing as opposed to baptism, what uh, procures salvation. And I'm preaching on kind of the home, the family, but homes are built out of individuals. Marriages are built out of individuals. And the first thing that has to happen is people have to be saved. And so if you're going to have a, a home, you know, that's, that's right, you need to be saved. And that's what we preached on last week, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death and burial and resurrection in our place for our sin. And uh, this morning I'm going to preach on the next message that I believe is important. Well, once you get saved, you need to develop a foundation of faith upon which everything else in your life can flow out of. And that's what I want to preach on this morning. And uh, I kind of got tickled. I put on Facebook about something. If you're not want to be challenged or something, don't listen or don't be here. And you all came. So uh, anyway, uh, and you're all listening, and we're glad you are. But uh, I guess it must have sounded pretty ornery and pretty mean, but it's not going to be a mean message. So you can relax, and it's okay, and you'll be okay, all right? And, and you, don't need, uh, you don't need army boots to be sitting here this morning, and be, it, everything will be all right. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Jesus said this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This is Sermon on the Mount material. Uh, so if you're, you, you love the Sermon on the Mount but don't like hellfire and brimstone preaching, you, you, you're, you're a little bit confused. But uh, I said last week, the first thing is get saved. But what do you do after you get saved? He tells you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Two things you're to seek. The kingdom of God and his righteousness, not your own. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, I want to say something to you. This is not a suggestion. This is not Jesus saying, I would like for you to to seek my kingdom first and my righteousness. I think it'd be a good idea if you did. It's a command. It's a direct command from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that you and I are to seek him first, his kingdom and his righteousness. All right. Now, the context springs out of verse 24. And I want you to look at verse 24 of that chapter. The Bible said, now, this is the context of the scripture where it's about verse 33. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve. Now, there's a negative preacher, isn't it? Any preacher that uses cannot is a negative preacher. (laughs) Being just a little bit ornery, okay? You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, we thank you this morning for the word of God and the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for your truth, for your righteousness, for your mercy, your grace, your goodness. Thank you, Jesus, that you suffered and died on the cross for us, shed your blood, paid for our sin. God, thank you that by faith in that blood, faith in that sacrifice, trusting Christ as our Savior who died in our place for our sin, we can be saved, forgiven, justified, reconciled to God, given eternal life, made a new creature in Jesus Christ. Given, Lord, a new name, a new home, a new place. God, we're thankful for that. And I praise you for that this morning. But I praise you for this book, Lord, because it is the book of life. And God, today I pray that you help us to preach it. And I pray that help folks will be helped on their journey. I pray, God, some foundation will be laid in the lives of people today, and I pray that you'd help us as a body of believers here at local church, that we would take these truths to heart, and, Lord, by that, you'd be able to use us for your glory's sake, for your kingdom's sake, and for your righteousness' sake. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll enable me to preach this with the right spirit. I pray, God, that you will help me not to be arrogant, not to be cocky, not to be condescending, uh, not to be critical or condemning, but, Lord, I do pray that you help me to preach with the authority of God's word. I pray you help me to speak the truth in love, and I pray, Heavenly Father, that my aim and my goal will be to exalt and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ and his worthiness and his right to be first place in every realm of our life. Lord, I pray that you help us today to warn of the realities of eternity and judgment. I pray for those that are lost without God that they'd be saved today. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Ghost of God have freedom and liberty in this congregation and this message today. And, Lord, give us all receiving hearts and yielded hearts to your sweet spirit and to your truth. And, Lord, help us to throw up our hands to surrender to the King of kings and Lord of lords, the lover of our soul, our Savior who died for us. Lord, apart from whom we have no hope. And it's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. 
I said there's a context here between, uh, from verse 33 back uh, to verse number 24 that he sets this thing out and he says that no man can serve two masters. And then between verse 24 and 33, he says this, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or drink, or for your body, what you shall put on, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. And then he says this, Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, now listen to this, folks, your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Don't seek clothing first. Don't seek eating first. Don't seek what you can drink and so forth and, and all that stuff first in your house and all these things that he mentions there earlier. He said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Now I want to tell you something. There's a sweet reward to this. Look at verse 34. Take note, therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil there. God can take away worry fretting, concern, and irritation from your life. And I literally lived on the last part of verse 34 for two or three years when I went through a really, really tough time in my life, sufficient to the days, the evil thereof. Because all I could see out in front of me was just trouble, 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 trouble. And God took that verse right there and comforted me and gave me peace through it and gave me strength. And it wasn't always easy, but he would remind me, sufficient to the day is the evil thereof, Reggie. You have no business worrying about tomorrow. Tomorrow's not here. You, may not, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Tomorrow might be the best day of your life. And if you're worrying beyond today, you're, mess, you're wasting your time. Now, <clears throat> when you look at this thing, you, you think, does God, uh, sometimes we think, well, God doesn't know our needs. Is God so ignorant that he doesn't even know our needs? Now, I'm talking here tonight after, I'm, we're talking this morning about, we're saved. Now, we want to start off on our Christianity to start off on our journey. You serve a God today that knows your needs. Believe, now, you need to believe this. But you, the truth about it is, if you're not careful, you don't really believe this. Because you think it's not up to him, it's up to you. That, it, we, that he doesn't even know our needs. Is he so weak? Is our God not only so ignorant that he doesn't know what we need, that he's so weak he can't even provide it? God knows that we have needed these basic necessities of life and has made a clear promise from his word that if we would seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that all these things, these necessities of life would be met in our life. All these things, that well, eating, drinking, clothing, the things that are really necessities. Now, I'm going to throw you a curveball. You better listen carefully. Anybody who really believes this does not want the government taking care of them. I want to ask you a question. Who would you rather have take care of you, God or the government? God. America's in problem and Christianity America is in, in America is in trouble because we say, we quote these verses and they sound real nicey-nicey, but we don't really believe it because in practicality, we'd rather have the government taking care of us. That's what all this pandemic thing and all this stimulus programs and all that stuff's about is to shift American people from depending upon God to bending government. And once that happens, they become God to us. Instead of God, they've displaced God. Now, the, the, but the idea of putting God first in our lives was not a new uh, thing. For in the Old Testament, Genesis 1-5, the first day, by the way, we worship on the first day. The seventh day was Saturday. Jesus was raised on the first day. The disciples met on the first day of the week. And here's the, here's the point. God wants you to give him the first day of the week. All right? So it's not a new concept. When Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, it's not a new concept. He was just reinforcing that. 
So we're to give God the first day. It said over there, uh, Jesus was resurrected the first day. If you study the Bible, and I'm going to try to move through this quick, but God had worship and so forth and ceremonies and all these things the first day, the first day of the week, the first day of the month, the first day of the year. You can check your Bible out about this in the offerings to God and the sacrifices and so forth. God commanded, not only commanded, he demanded their first fruits of their, of their produce, the first of their dough. That's where, how many knows, how many knows that money is often called dough? They got that out of the Bible because the dough, D-O-U-G-H, bread, their first dough was to be given to God. It's first their increase. That's where that concept came in our language. They were to give the first year's lamb and God was to have the firstborn male out of every family. And you had to redeem it. You had to kill an ass. You had to redeem that firstborn. God said all the firstborn males out of every family is his. By the way, God slew all the firstborn males in Egypt because Egypt said we will not give our children to God. Are you listening to me? We are going to give our children to our false gods. God said, "Uh uh-uh, you won't have your firstborn males. Now listen to me today. This is, this is far more serious than we, than a lot of times we conceive. God is a God of first place and he never takes second. Uh, I had a fellow here in church brought me a trophy. I wanted to see this trophy. I said, I need a trophy just to illustrate. Now, you know, trophies are funny things. People will nearly die to get one and 15 years later, they don't know where they're at. And 30 years later, somebody sent them to the, to the reclamation center, the recycling center. Or they're down there in the trash pile or they're in some box and somebody wonders what that was about. But I want to use this trophy today in a sense of what trophy are you giving Jesus Christ? What trophy is Jesus Christ getting that you are literally, by the way, we are trophies of his grace. Now I want to ask you, what trophy are you giving Jesus Christ out of your life? What place does he honestly and actually and in reality have in our lives? What place trophy is this? Now, so we see this concept of first. In Exodus twenty-two twenty-nine, 29, the firstborn son was specifically given to the Lord and everything else. In Proverbs 3, 9, the Bible said, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Now, it is God's, everything that we have is God's, the earth is is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But our increase that God gives you us in our labor or whatever we do is in a special way designed as a a mechanism of worship in that God says, I want the first of everything in your life. uh, Isaiah chapter 44, verse number six, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and his, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. In Isaiah 40, 12, hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am the first and also the last. So we see here that in the Old Testament, God calls himself the first and the last, okay? When you get into New Testament, in the book of Revelation, and it's Revelation 1, chapter 11, 17, and verse 17, Jesus said, I am the first and the last. Can anybody tell me what you learn out of that? That the one who said he's first and last in the Old Testament, Jehovah, Lord, is none other than Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Amen. And he's the first and the last. And what he's telling us here, he's God. He has first place in every issue and in every area of our lives. And he not only demands it, he is worthy of it. Amen. He is God. All right. So we see that Jesus is, now as such, he's the first. Uh, By the way, he'll be first when Armageddon's over. You can mark that down. He'll be first when this world's on fire. And as such, he's first. He's to be first in every way, in every area of our lives. God is to be and receive the first in all areas and all aspects of our life. This is a biblical truth for saved people. First of all, we get saved. Then he says, I want you to lay a foundational truth down in your life. That everything you do in every aspect of your life, I want you to put me first. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm preaching this because I want you to be blessed. Not with wealth, 
I'm not interested in that. I want you to be blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I want you to have true blessings that come from obedience to God Almighty. Because one of the most dangerous things that you and any of us can get into, I have struggled with this all my life, is putting God first in every area of my life. So I preach it not to condemn you, not to beat you down. I preach it to encourage you to really do some thinking. In specific areas of my life, am I putting God first? And what's going to be the ramifications if I do not? And what will be the ramifications if I do? God is to be first in our lives. He's, as I said, he, we're to give him the first fruits of all of our increase. He's to have this firstborn in a special way. I've preached on that before years ago. I'll probably preach on it again this year. God helping me. Why, there, there's a reason Satan wants the firstborn of your, chi- of your family. I'll tell you something. He'll go after your firstborn with a vengeance. God wants the, not only the first son, but he wants the first day of the week. That's what we're doing here. He wants the first part of every day. The, if you read in the Bible, the men of God would get up early in the morning and give the first part of their day to the Lord. So God wants the first day of the week. He wants the first part of every day. God wants to be first in our devotion. God wants to be first in our affections. God wants to be first in our fellowship. God wants to be first in all of our human relationships. God is to be first in our decisions. God is in making God is to be first in our conduct. God is to be first in all of our activities. God is to be first in our political activity. God is to be first in our educational activity. God is to be first in our marriage. God is to be first in our work. There's no place uh, any issue of your life where God Almighty is not to be first. Uh, now, I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and we're going to see about the practicality of what it means. Now, it's, it's uh, the Lord dealt with me about this. He said, like, Reggie, you know, you popping off saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay, what does that mean in practical daily living? It's not enough just to say that from the pulpit. What does it mean to the people? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to the families, the individuals that's coming to church there Sunday? What does it mean for these people, Re- Reggie, for them to put me first? And so this is what we're going to be looking at. And God provides us the perfect examples. Now, in Luke chapter 9, let's go to verse number, well, you probably got it up here on uh, 60. Uh, uh, if you guys can get that up there. Luke chapter 9. Make sure I'm where I need to be. Chapter 50, chapter 9, verse 57. I apologize for that. Chapter 9, verse 57. Everybody there say amen. amen. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, now watch this, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now, you can say here and debate whether this is talking about discipleship or salvation. I personally believe it's, it leans more to the deal of discipleship rather than salvation. He's talking to people that had professed Christ as Savior, and they said, we're going to follow you with us wherever you go. Now watch this carefully. Verse 58, what was Jesus' response to the man who said, I will follow thee with us wherever they go? Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Did you notice you never hear from that guy again? He never responded to Jesus Christ. He's just gone from history. You know what? He didn't like what Jesus said. He said, you mean to tell me that I'm not going to have a bed to sleep on tonight? That I'm not going to have a roof over my head if I follow you? In fact, if you'll follow Jesus, you'll find out this truth. Jesus would go out and he spent the night many times in prayer on the mountainside. I mean, he liked to go camping. <laughs> Hang on to your hats a little bit, okay? But he said, when this man said, oh, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. You know what? He was lying out his teeth. He didn't mean that no more than we do about things. It just sounded real spiritual. I bet he thought everybody around in the crowd thought, boy, that sounds good. Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. Jesus said, all right, I'll follow me. Birds there got nests, foxes have holes, but I don't have any place for you to lay your head on. Zero. Boom, he's gone. Look at the next thing, verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Hmm. People haven't changed. Now, this gets pretty wild. I want you to notice something here. We're in Luke chapter 9. We're down about verse 57 through 62, but I want you to look at verse 26 in that chapter. Again, in the context. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words. You know what that means? You're saying to Christ in the Bible. You'll back up. You'll you'll shut up and you'll back up and you'll be quiet and you'll compromise and bow down when it comes to standing for Jesus Christ and, his, and the Bible. He said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, 
of him shall the son of man be ashamed when he cometh in his own glory and in his father's and the holy angels. Now, I don't know all the implications or ramifications of Jesus Christ being ashamed of me when he comes, but I don't, it ain't good. You can make out of that whatever you want to, but if Christ is ashamed of me at his coming, that's not good. That's bad. That's not going to be a positive thing for this old boy's state. All right, so that's in the context of this, and these guys are bragging about, talking about how they want to follow Christ. So Jesus told him there in verse 59, he said, another follow me, but he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Now, I'm going to tell you something, bury my father, that's a pretty big time in your life. My daddy died about four years ago, four, three and a half years ago. And I'll tell you what, it, you know, it's a point in my life that's just like marked. And if I'd have been out with Jesus when he said, now he, I, he said, he said, follow me. And I said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my dad first. Now look at Jesus' response. If you think this is light stuff. Jesus said in him, verse 60, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Hmm. You mean, Lord, I can't even take off to go bury my dad? Now just stay tied to the saddle and keep your feet in the stirrups here, okay? Just stay tied because we're going to be balanced, I promise you. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, watch this, God is talking to man. In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, man is talking to God. You always want to make sure who's talking to who in your life. Now, he said, let me go first and bury my father. Important matter. What is Jesus saying to this man? Is he saying your daddy doesn't matter? No. But he's saying this. Did you notice that word in verse 59? Jesus, and he said it to another, follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me. Underline it in your Bible. What? First. You know what he's telling Jesus? You are not first. That's what he told him. He said, Jesus, I'll follow you. But you're not first. And you need to know that. Watch this. He said, Jesus... I'm going to give you a trophy in my life, but it's not going to be first place. It's going to be second place. That man literally said it. He said, let me first. Jesus said, when God talked to man, he said, seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. This man said, Lord, let me first go bury my daddy. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 10. Hold your Luke 9. Go to Matthew chapter 10. This is teaching as well as preaching. And I hope that you'll hang in there and, and uh, let God speak to your heart. I'm trying to let him do that to me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before me and him will I confess before my father which is in heaven. But whoso shall deny me before me and him will I also deny before my father which is in heaven. Again, I do not want to just try to explain to you all the ramifications of being denied. But if you're denied before the father in heaven, that ain't a good situation. All right, look at verse number 35, not th th verse 34. This is a different Jesus than, the, than churches are preaching. This is a different Jesus than the world's preaching. Look what he says. Think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. Well, wait a minute. When the angels, didn't the angels say peace on earth, goodwill to men when Jesus born? Yes, they did. But they're talking about the kingdom. There won't be peace on this earth till the millennial kingdom. And Jesus, the prince of peace, rules with a rod of iron. And he will make peace through war and force and power. Okay. But he said, until that point, he said, think not that I'm come to send peace. I'm come not to send peace, but a sword. Now watch what, and so now he don't leave, he don't leave you to wonder what that means. Look at verse 35. For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father. What did that man want to do before he would follow Jesus? He wanted to go bury his father. Jesus said, I'm come to set a man at variance against his father. Well, wait a minute, Lord, I thought Christianity was all about home and family and, and relationship. It is. Here's the great truth. You can never have the right relationship with your father, your mother, your wife, your husband, your child, your son, your mommy, your daddy, unless you have Jesus Christ absolutely first place in your life. You will never, never have a right relationship with anybody that you put behind in front of Jesus Christ. And this is the wisdom that we don't have. This is what's killing us, even in our Christianity. We put, he's not... You know, he's not fourth place, he's not fifth place, but, but he's not first in this area. So Jesus, here's your second place. I'm going to tell you a little something. Jesus ain't taking no second place trophy from you. 
He is not taking any second place trophy from you. You just will hit that down on your head. He's God Almighty and he's the first and the last. All right. Now watch what he said there. He said, not only is said a man various against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. But Jesus, I, I thought the Bible taught that families ought to get along good and love each other. Well, you haven't studied real life very much. Did you know the first two brothers, one killed, killed, killed one? Did you know that the idealistic, the idealistic climate that Christianity that we have up here, this puffy cloud stuff is not the reality? The Jesus is telling you about you. Truth about you is, if you really come out clean for Jesus Christ and stand for God and stand for the word of God, like he said, if you're not ashamed of me and of my words, you're going to lose some of your family. You're going to lose some of your friends. You're going to lose people. It's just the fact of it. We just will get used to that. We just will accept it as a reality. I had some kind of, you know, false concept deal in my head when I got saved friend and priest that, boy, you know, we just bring kumbaya. We just bring everybody together. Everybody's going to love each other at church. We're going to have a wonderful time. It ain't turned out that way. It turned out exactly like Jesus said it'd be. Well, he said there, watch verse 37 of chapter 10, Matthew. He that loveth father or mother, watch this, more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is, I'm going to get in this pretty soon. This, I've seen this truth ruin more families than any one issue in my life. Yeah. Verse 38, he that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Who that shall findeth his life shall lose it. Who that, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You put Jesus first, you'll find your life. You don't put Jesus first, you'll lose your life. Okay? So now, Let's go to Luke chapter 14. It gets a little stronger. He said, Thou lovest them more than me. Oh, okay, Lord Jesus. Boy, I appreciate that. I'll try to love you more than I do my son and my daughter, my wife, my husband, my daddy, and my mama. And then he comes over to Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Now, I'm going to tell you Luke chapter 14, verse 25, and right in there, uh, Bible, com- Bible commentary, guys, I don't even read them anymore. It ain't even worth reading. And those little side notes under your Bible will say all kinds of stupid stuff. And preachers will get up and they'll, they'll wash this passage of scripture right down the creek. They do not like and do not believe this. And then here's where they really like to get them a new version. They don't like what this says. Look at chapter uh, 14, verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him. Now here's Jesus. He's walking. I don't know where he's walking at here for sure, but he's walking. And there's great multitudes following him. And all of a sudden he just stops and turns around and says something to him. He said this, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Here's that negative preacher again, all time saying you can't, you can't, you can't. Look at verse 27. He's going to do it again. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which, and then he tells you in verse 28 down through there, he says, you need to count the cost. Now, I'm going to skip some stuff and just keep moving today, but you just write these scriptures down and do some studying on when you get your own time, okay? And it'll confirm to you these, these truths. But he's going to talk to him in verse 28 down there through about the cost of following the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, you need to sit down and do some figuring. Are you ready to pay the price for putting me first in your life? You know, what? I'm just going to be real honest with you. You know what the devil trying to tell me right now while I'm preaching? You're wasting your time preaching it. No, people are not interested in this, Reggie. Now, you're right. The devil's a liar. He never, all he ever says is a lie. But that's, what's, that's what he's trying to tell me. Reggie, people are not interested in putting Jesus first. You're wasting it. This country's gone, Reggie. You're wasting your time. They just, they, just, they just wanted Jesus. They can put second, third, fourth, wherever in their life. Give him their little trophies and feel like they've really done Jesus a job. He gets down to verse 33. Here's the third negative, verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. I mean, you know what they'll say about verse 26? Well, that means that your love for Jesus is so much that you that it seems like, hey, and they'll come up with all this stuff. Come on, I tell you something. This is the word of God. 
It don't have one mistake in it. It doesn't have one bad translation in it. It doesn't have one error in it. It doesn't have one, one deal that wasn't said right. Every word is perfect. Every letter is perfect. Every jot and tittle is perfect. And let me just tell you something about it. It either means what it says or it don't mean nothing. And you let God take care of the rest of it. But your Savior, the one we claim that we want to put first, that's what he said. Now, I'm going to tell you something about it. I believe with all my heart this is when the world saw Christianity march, march as an army across the paganism of this world when they believed what I'm preaching this morning. When Jesus was absolutely be- first before their own life. But this is so far away from American concept of Christianity. It's just, it's like, what are you talking about? Now, I'm going to give you an example of this. And you don't turn there this morning. We'll try to move. Genesis 22, the father of faith, a guy named Abraham, right? You follow Abraham. If you want to know about a life of faith, follow him. Study him hard. Now, Abraham had a son by promise, Isaac. And one day God told him in Genesis 22, he said, you take that son, thine only son. And he said, you take him up and you offer him. And you know what Abraham did? He didn't fuss with God. He didn't argue with God. He took off with him and he took the wood and he took the knife and so forth. And they get up there and he takes this boy. Remember what God said about firstborns? That wasn't new with, with Moses. That was, before, that was before Moses. That was back in Abraham. You know what God knew? That if we're not careful, we'll make idols out of our children. And our children will be the very thing we put in front of God. And God says, I'll not have you put your son or your daughter above me. And so Abraham takes him up there and he puts him on the altar and he raises the knife to kill his own son. Now, this is not paganism. God stepped in and had an angel stop him. He said, there's a ram over the great lesson. I don't really want your son. I want you. And so that ram in the bush was a picture of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God as a sacrifice and substitute for us. The whole thing was an object lesson of the sacrificial substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, dying for our sins, providing us salvation. But here's something in his, Abraham was already saved. What God was saying, Abraham, I am going to be first in your life. And if it's going to be a life of faith, you're going to have to put me first. And it's going to have to be above that, which is the dearest, most cherished thing you have. Now listen to me right now. Every person listening to me or in here listening to me who has any inkling of an idea to put Jesus first in your life, he is going to test you. And he's going to test you in the areas of life that are the most personal and the most precious to you. You mark it down in your day book. But Abraham understood this concept of Matthew 6, 33. Watch this. God said, leave your country. He left it. God said, leave your kindred. He left them. God said, leave your nephew. He left him. He said, leave your son that you conceived in the flesh, Ishmael. Got rid. I mean, he's everything. God says, I'm first. I'm first. Everything, everything about your life. You put it by, you put it behind me. I'm going to be first. Then it came down to Isaac, that, that one that he had promised. And the Bible, and the Bible says he, he, that he, the dearest thing he had, God says, you put me above him. God, now, I want you to think about this. In reality, Jesus Christ requires more allegiance than any dictator or tyrant that has ever lived on the face of the earth. Did you know that? Now, he's not a tyrant and he's not a dictator, but he is God. And we need to lift our concept of who God is. We are his creation created for his glory. He owns us by creative right and redemptive right. And has provided a a relationship of love, not force. But in that relationship, and I'll prove this to you. God will show a little bit. And in that thing, he is leading us not to the obey me, but I want to obey. Not putting me first. I want to put Jesus Christ first. That's That's what's going on. It's higher. He has the right to demand your absolute devotion, my absolute devotion, and obedience. He's our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, our king, our judge, and our ruler. Luke 18, 28. If you, can you get that, guys? Luke 18, 28. Don't, don't turn there right now. Just write the reference down. Luke 18 and verse 28 through 30. 
Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren and wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake. Tie this to Matthew 6.33. Who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come everlasting life. Now let me say something to you. I have lived this truth. Probably not to its fullest, but I have lived to its truth. Whether you understand this or not, when I surrendered to preach, that for me personally, I'll just share this with you. I knew that night it meant putting God before my family, before my dad, my mom, before my brothers, my sisters, before my friends at church, before everybody. I knew that God had to be, in order to preach the Bible and to be, and God called me and I had to put him above everybody else. That was my hardest struggle. But in my spirit, I knew that if I preach this Bible, I cannot worry or be fearful or put them above God and back away from preaching the truth just because it might be offensive to somebody. Are you listening to me? Can I tell you something? Again, this is why God wants you to put Christ above every relationship first because without that, you cannot have the relationship that you could have and should have by not putting Jesus Christ first. Now, does Jesus require being first in your life in every area? To the, watch this. Hang on there. We're going to balance it now. Truth out of balance is heresy every time. If I didn't say this, I'd be preaching truth out of balance. Jesus does not require him being first in your life to the neglect of your duties to those people in your life. He taught. In fact, he condemned the Pharisees for not taking care of their parents. For, for, for figuring out a religious way, Corbin, to not take care of their mom and dad. They're to honor your father and your mother. All right? How about your wife? Husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. You're, I'm not to neglect my wife and say, honey, you don't matter. I'm going to go preach. Okay? How about Children. My kids don't matter. I got to go preach or I got to go live for the Lord. I got to serve God. No, he said, anybody that doesn't care for his own is worse than an infidel and have denied the faith. So it's not to the neglect of your personal responsibility to the people that God has put in your life. Keep it in balance. We're to bring up our children, train our children, discipline our children, and so forth. But being putting Jesus first in our life. We'll make that happen according to scripture and it'll be a blessing to you and it'll be a a, a bountiful in your life and it'll be what God intended for it to be. The truth is we cannot be to others what God wants you to be unless Jesus Christ is first. I'm telling you what, my wife's sitting right here and honey, I'll tell you what my biggest problem is. Me not being to you what I need to be is because when I don't put Jesus first. Does this make sense to you? If I have literally put Jesus Christ first in every issue of my life, I'll be able to love her as Christ loved the church, but not unless. See, it's not, it's not to the neglect of my work and my responsibilities and my relationships. It's just that God Almighty has so ordained in the counsels of God that if he is not put first in your life, it is impossible for you to fulfill your other human responsibilities in a right way and with the, with the blessings and results that you'd like to have. Amen. Amen. And he'll illustrate this more as we get into some of these other areas. But we're to never put our spouse, children, family, work, pleasure, possessions before, even close to first and before Christ. God is a God of order and a God of priorities. Matthew 6.33 is a verse of life priorities. And to the degree that you get those priorities straight, your life can be blessed. Uh, God is a God of order. He's to be first and then your spouse and then your children and then other people. And of course, the church and so forth and work and business. Let me tell you how God illustrates this in Scripture. Uh, Sid and his uh, bride, Claire, got married yesterday. We got a couple here getting married here in a couple of weeks. In the Old Testament, God is pictured as being married to the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, the Son, Jesus Christ, is pictured as being married to the church. Paul says it this way in Romans 7 4 Wherefore, my, bro- my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. 
What is God saying here? There is, the church is pictured as being married to Christ, as the bride of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul talks to the Corinthians, For I am jealous over you, watch this, with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So we're pictured as being married to Christ. It's also in Ephesians chapter 5 when it talks about husbands, Lord your eyes, even as Christ, and it says, I speak unto you concerning Christ and the church. It's a mystery. Three times in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God says that he is a jealous God. There is such a thing as godly jealousy. Can I say something to you husbands? Every one of you husbands need to be jealous of your wife. It ought to tick you off if you see, if you see somebody flirting with your wife. It ought to tick you off if you see your wife flirting with another man. There is such a thing as godly jealousy. Why? Because there's a God-ordained priority of relationships and affections. I mean, uh, what about this? By the way, let me throw something to you. Paul's talking to a church. Every pastor ought to be jealous, have a godly jealous of that church. He, you know what? He ought to have an attitude that I don't like seeing you put other things out here in the world above Jesus Christ. Amen. How about this at your wedding? You stand up there. J- Jordan, you can relate to this now. You stand up here to the wedding and you say, will you, and, and, and the preacher asks, is it Edie or Evie? Evie. Evie. That's what I thought. I thought somebody this morning said Edie and I thought I've got it wrong again. I called Livia, Lydia for 42 years. 42. It's almost true. But how about this at your wedding? You come up here and you stand and Evie, she stand up there and the preacher says, will you put this man above all human relationships and affections? She says, well, yeah, unless my old boyfriend comes back around. How's that going to fly, Jordan? Huh? Wouldn't get off the ground. That plane ain't flying. Amen. That plane ain't flying. How come we easily understand that? And we're married to Christ. But we put other things and other people before Jesus Christ. And he's jealous. And you, and you husbands say, that ain't flying. You wives say, well, how, about, how about this? Uh, 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 Jordan, will you put this lady above all human relationships and affections? Yeah, unless my mama needs me back home. How's that flying? Well, yeah, I'll put her first unless the employee needs me more than, you know, than her. But if my employee needs me more than my wife, I'm not so sure about it. Well, yes, unless they need me to work down church for something. James chapter 4, verse 4 puts it this way. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. God says, I do not want you flirting with the world. I do not want you putting the world in front of me and, 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 and so forth. Whosoever therefore be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. God's saying, hey, you're going over here and chubbing up and flirting with the world and all the world's garbage and all the world stuff. And God says, I don't like it. And that may, you're an adulterer or an adulterous mad woman there. First John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How will it be with the fellows if your wife, I mean, how would you like it? The day after church, you know, if, you, if your wife uh, visits and laughs and just acts like she's having delight talking to some old boy. And you say, well, honey, it's about time to go home. And she goes, do we have to go? I'm, I'm just enjoying visiting with him so much. I think you might have a visit out in the car, right? Huh? But how can we understand that in our earthly, our earthly deals that you know, our husband or spouse is supposed to be first, but not with Jesus? Well, how's it in your wife if your husband uh, says about another woman on the way home? Boy, she's sure pretty, ain't she, honey? (laughs) I mean, if you're that dumb, guys, even if you think that, don't say that. Amen. (laughs) I mean, uh, uh, this lady comes up and you say, yeah, but she has such a nice personality. By putting Jesus in his word first, you're able to righteously fulfill all other relationships in your life. And if you don't, you can't. The disciples left their nets, they left their families, they left their work to follow Jesus first. And watch this, and they changed the world. 
it's not that the gospel doesn't have power and the Bible doesn't have power. It's we're not, we're not putting our priorities right and putting Jesus first in this world. What does it mean in reality? Now, here's where it's going to get tough. This is why I put out what I did on Facebook. Here's where it's going to get tough. Because you know what? I wouldn't give you a nickel for everything I've preached so far unless you make it practical. What does it mean for you to put Jesus first in your daily life? Well, let me just hit, first of all, preachers. Often people, especially preachers, will put their denomination first and not Jesus Christ. It's all over this country. They'll die for the denomination, and then they'll claim Jesus didn't. Oh, that Bible's not right. Remember, he said, me and my words. And they'll say, the Bible's got mistakes in it. Or they'll say, well, our denomination, we, we just don't believe that. It's whatever the denomination says is first. That's why, can I just tell you, that's why the Holy Spirit, that's why Ichabod's writ, written on almost every denomination in America right now. That's why you got lesbians being their pastors. Because Ichi, God's gone! God's gone! They put their denomination above the truth of God's word. And now all they want is a hireling. Sometimes preachers will put ministry. I, I say this in all honesty. Sometimes preachers will put the ministry above Christ. If I'm neglecting to obey the word of God concerning my wife and my children, but I'm busy in the ministry, I'm not putting Christ first. Sometimes even the church, you can serve in the church and neglect Christ. Your marriage Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God says, I'm going to be first in your marriage. You can't put your husband first. You can't put your wife first. It has to be God first. Both of you need to put God first in your heart and your life. A big one is children. You put Christ first is the key to raising children correctly. Never, ever allow or put your children above the word, Christ, the truth, or whatever's right. And let me go back to this marriage thing. I'm telling you right now, if a preacher puts his wife above the word of God... Or if he puts friends above the word, you talk, see what I'm saying? God's got to be first. The worst things I've ever seen is when parents did what Eli did. In 1 Samuel 29, the Bible said, Eli, who was the high priest, said, you honored your sons above me. And he said, because of that, he said, I'm going to destroy your posterity forever. Cut your arm off. He said, he said your kids will crouch and they'll be on welfare. That's what he said. They won't even be able to provide for themselves. Why? Because he said, you honored your kids above me. And here's what it was. His boys were messing around with the women at the temple. And he knew it. And he wouldn't say anything about it. And wouldn't do anything about it. And here's, here's how this works. When your child is doing wrong and you won't do anything about it, you're putting him or that her above Jesus Christ. Let me tell you the greatest thing your child needs to know today is that you love Jesus Christ more than them. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean you're mean. It doesn't mean you're vicious. It just means your child needs to know that you're not selling out Christ just because I love you. And if you're wrong, I'm not going to be with you. I'm staying with Christ. Christ is right. And by the way, that's how you'll inculcate true living faith in your children. But all across this country, people will sell out. I mean, they'll sell out instantly for their child. Their child does it. It's okay. Your child does it. It ain't no good. Child worship is idolatry. In our homes, in our houses, our property, I want to ask you, is Jesus Christ first? Are there things in your house today that if Jesus Christ literally were to come visit your house, you wouldn't want him to see? Christ has to be above government. That's why... We went four weeks, didn't have, I did it because I didn't know what was going on how, about this COVID thing. We didn't have church for four weeks back here in March. After that fourth week, I'm telling you, if I ever heard a voice from God Almighty, it was, he said, you have church, you get that church house open. And we've had it open ever since. Amen. Now, they didn't tell me to shut down. I didn't shut down because somebody told me I was trying to do it out of prudence. And I didn't want the devil telling me, everybody that we was just didn't care about it. But that was, that was my main, I didn't want to give Satan a, a means of reproaching the church. But you listen to me. I'm not going to put any government edict or order or executive order above God's word and above Jesus Christ. We're going to have church. Now, if it honestly becomes some kind of a health situation where, you know, it was absolutely, I, I wouldn't do some kind of accommodation. That, but I'm telling you, that, that's never been what this is. Never. 
there's a pastor in, in, in Canada that's in jail this morning while you're in church because he wouldn't shut his church down. Pastors in California, I hate to say this, but a lot of them have sold out. Yep. You mark it in your day book. If I'm alive and I'm, I'm the pastor of this church, we were gonna, we're going to have church. We are not shutting down the government tells us to. I'm going to put God above government. You're going to have to put God above government. There's some things I don't even want to get into this morning. Back there in Luke chapter 9 and verse number, uh, let's go back to Luke and verse number 9, verse 61. Yeah, Luke chapter 9, verse 61, back where we was earlier. Now, he just got through talking to this guy about burying his dad. He said, you let the dead bury their dead. Verse 61, another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my house, home, at home at my house. He said, he said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me go say bye, mom and daddy. Jesus said, no man, having put his hand to the plow, verse 62, to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, he is saying, I'm first, I'm not second place. You're not giving me your second place trophy in life. This is the deal we've got to get down this morning, try to understand. Jesus, he said, he said, Lord, I, I, he said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go and take care of my business. Lord, here's my second place trophy. Lord, knowest thou not that I love my possessions and my family more than thee? <laughs> now, don't go to sleep on me here. Don't tune me out because you'd have to go back and get a tape. Make sure you heard what I said. You wouldn't believe how many times I've been somewhere on this church property or somewhere out here, especially down the gym, and somebody kind of walk over and ease down, sit beside me and say, I want to talk to you for a minute. It's okay. What are you talking about? You said preaching the other day, and what they say is no more the truth. I said, wait a minute. This is all recorded. Why don't we just go get a CD and a t- tape? Let's just sit down and listen to it. That's not what I said, and that's not the way I said it. Oh, yeah, you did. I said, well, let's go get a CD. And they never, I have yet to have one person going to go get the CD. <laughs> You know, that's just, that's pretty sorry. So make sure you're listening. We need to put Jesus first above our activities and our recreations. Lord, we've got a ball game. I will follow thee, but I've got a ball game. Lord, here's your second place trophy. It's going to get you. I'm telling you, he ain't taking second place. He's not taking it. Don't fool yourself. This whole country will put a ball game before Christ any day of the week. Bunch of you grandpas, if your grandson had a t-ball game on Sunday at 1230, you'd leave church early to get there. When the best thing you could have done is said, Lord, grandson, I tell you what, I would love to be there and I want to be there and I'm going to be there, but it'll be after church. I'm going to put Jesus first, okay? And I I love you, but I'm going to put the Lord first. Everybody with me? Am I saying this mean? Am I being hateful? Arrogant? Condescending? No. I'm just trying to help you. I've seen this over and over again. I've seen parents make idols out of their kids and put their kids before God Almighty, and I've seen it cost them until nobody knows. It's not going to pay. Your generations will pay for you trying to get Jesus to play second fiddle. The only problem is Jesus never has, never has, never will play second fiddle to nobody. Lord, I'll follow thee, but it's deer season. Now, some of you do need a flip to go hunting, but a lot of people do. Lord, it's deer season. It just comes around once a year. Now, I know that old buck's down there in that brush patch. And I know some of these other guys are going to go to church this morning. They won't be down there. It's my perfect chance. I will follow thee, Lord, after I get done deer hunting. I will follow thee, Lord, after I get done fishing. The white bass are biting. You know, Lord, they're run. The, the fish are up. They're hitting. Lord, I will follow thee after I play golf. Boy, I don't tell you what, I'd hate to be so bored to play golf. <laughs> Them people are bored, Amen. Oh, boy. Lord, I will follow thee, but I'm going camping. Now, I want to tell you something. (laughs) I 
Okay, I ain't done preaching yet. <laughs> Jesus said this, come apart and rest a while. <laughs> Balance the scripture. Hey, some of you need to take a camping trip in here. Amen. You're so wore out, so fatigued out, burned out. How many of you know that I take off anywhere from two to four Sundays a week here? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm gone a year. I, there's just times I need to be gone. Amen. Last fall, Karen and I took off, and on a Sunday morning, I know this is demonic, but we took off over Easter, and we went and visited eight or ten big springs in, over here on a Sunday morning, just me and her. I'm not advocating you do that just for recreation. I'm not saying do that to the neglect of your Lord. But when camping or golfing or fishing becomes where, you know, God's just, you know, this is going to come first and God come, if I happen to make it, I'll make it. And if I don't, this is really what I'd rather be doing is going to the ball game than going to church. I'd way rather go do this than go to church and serve the Lord. Then you've got a problem. I want you to kill that big buck. Give me the tenderloin. I want you to enjoy life. You know, God's not against you having a good time. He's for you. But he knows if you tell your kids that, that there's stuff they're doing is more important than him, it's going, he'll get your kids. If he doesn't get them, he'll get their grandkids. Because what one generation does in moderation, the next does in excess. God wants to be first in your music. God, God wants to be first in your dress, in your appearance. Let me say further today that God wants to be first in your education. Can I say something to you? Education is not, another, it's not like a job or something else in your life. It's totally different than anything like that. Education is where the belief system of your children is going to be formed. And it's not a light matter. The public school system, which is a government school system, did you know Jesus doesn't even get a second place trophy? He doesn't even get a last place trophy. He's, he doesn't even get a participation trophy. He's not even on the field. He's not in the bleachers. He's not in the park. He's out. Maybe he might be mentioned as some abstract historical figure I never will forget in my life. I had a, a preacher come to me one time bringing a textbook from over here across the street, showing me how that they were teaching Christianity over here. Beat this thing I ever saw in my life. Come to me over here at the cell barn. Want me to sit down by him and show me how they were teaching Christianity over here at the school. And he said, here's their teaching. It's a religion, historical religion class. And they taught about Hindus. They taught about Muslims. They taught about Buddhists. taught about Christianity. And their teaching about Christianity was the Crusades. They taught nothing about Christianity. But, oh, we're teaching Christianity. You know what he was doing? He was trying to salve his guilty conscience. You say, uh, Reggie, that's not right. <clears throat> well, I dare you. Why don't you go see if you can get over the loudspeaker Monday morning and see if you can pray in Jesus' name and talk to him about how Jesus is God Almighty and he's the way, the truth, and life, and no man come to Father but by him and how that Jesus Christ suffered and died for their sins and how you'll go to hell without Christ. And he's King of kings and Lord of lords and no, nothing else is to be put by, in front of him. See how that flies. The honest truth about it is the public schools are controlled by the National Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers, and PTA. And if you don't think I'm telling you the truth, then you do your study. Tell me what you come up with. And they control the Department of Education, who controls the curriculum. 
and the content and course instruction and who also controls the local school boards because the school boards don't do what they tell them they won't get the money. Let me tell you what's coming down the pike. If Biden and these liberals get their way, they're going to force these schools to open these bathrooms up to these child molesters. That's in the works. It's not possibly coming down the road. They're going to try to do it. They've got transvestites up there in charge. I believe with all my heart that Biden himself is a pedophile. I believe he's a child molester. Why would any man promote laws and enact laws and sign executive orders that licenses and permits child molestation? Have you ever read the stated beliefs, the goals, the agenda, and positions of the National Education Association, the AFT, and the PTA? They've all three now combined, basically, in spirit for one goal, and that is to transform America from a Judeo-Christian-based country to their concept of humanism. Hell could not write a more anti-constitutional and anti-biblical document on every issue. Now, you listen to me right now. I'm putting Christ first. And I'm actually putting him ahead of my own life. Because I know what, I'm, what I've just preached and said. I say that in any church around this area. I'm dead meat. I'm dead meat anyway to him. But the public education system is a cult. And it is cursed. Doesn't mean everybody's bad that's in it. Didn't say that. The system is a cult. It's a humanistic cult to promote the worship of man. Critical race theory is just now being inculcated in Springfield school systems. You need to help Calvin Morrow. He's trying to get parents organized up there to get it out. No person can say that Jesus is first in the American education system and be honest. He's not even last. But all these areas where Jesus is not first, whether it's our homes, our business, our work. Now, let me say something to you. about. I want you to get this straight. I'm, Lord, what's my mind? I'm going to say it. Putting Jesus first does not mean you're necessarily at church every service, although I believe you ought to be if you can be. All right? There are ambulance people today that are working that if you had a car, Rick, you'd sure hope somebody was working there. There are people working in the hospitals today that if you had a heart attack, you'd, you'd hate to hear they're all at church. Okay, there is a balance, but make sure that it's not something you kind of want anyway. Make sure you're not orchestrating things so that you cannot be at church. Because then you have a heart problem. The ox in the ditch. You know, you don't get up on Sunday morning and there's a cow down there trying to kiff and she kiffs stuck and she's having trouble and you don't say well bless God I'll put Jesus first I'm going on to church I, I, I don't buy that I think I ought to go down and help try to help pull that kid or get you know she's having trouble now there's but you got to use some sense about it right you know it's just not don't get all don't get all like that about stuff and again I, <laughs> I couldn't believe Lord had me preach this today but don't don't get rigid about church going. You know what I'm saying? Make it a joy, not a I have to. That's what I'm getting to. And do take off. The church has wonderful services when Don Zen goes camping. <laughs> I told you I'd get you. I'm 
I'll tell you something right now. You do need to get out. You do need to go do things that's fun with your kids. Your children are going to, your children are going to remember that camping trip. And you've taken time for them. That's what they're going to remember. And they're going to know, they're going to know whether you're you know, putting God in the back burner or not. They, they know your intent. They know that. But they also know that, that uh, they know when you're expressing your love and concern for their life. Life goes by real fast. I promise you. So I hope that you get this in balance. The reason, though, that Christ is not first in our lives is because of love. Love is what puts somebody first. You can't force me to love Karen. You can't force me to be what I ought to be to Karen. You can't force me to be what I ought to be to this church. We have to love to put things first. I want to ask you, where is Jesus Christ in your life this morning? Have you given him second place trophy? He's not taking it. He'll throw it down. He'll throw it down at your feet. He'll bust it at your feet at judgment. All these areas where he's not first is because he's not first in our hearts and our affections and our devotion. If we love the Lord, he'll be first. Can you honestly say this morning that Jesus is first in your heart and your life? Does his word have your glad and happy obedience? Or are you just talking? Or at the worst, are you lying? Are you really saying, like those in the text, Lord, suffer me to go bury my father first. Suffer me to tell everybody goodbye first. Lord, suffer me to make my living first. Lord, suffer me to play my game first. Lord, suffer me my recreation first. Suffer me to let the world educate my children. And Lord, here's your second place trophy. Let's stand together and be dismissed today. As our heads are bowed and eyes closed today, I want to ask you an honest question. Can you honestly say that Jesus Christ is absolutely first in your life? Or is he just somewhere back or second, third, or fourth? You know, I probably don't love you near as much as I love myself, but I love myself enough to know that I want to put Jesus Christ first, hopefully because I love him, but I don't want to see it destroy my posterity because I put other things in front of God. I don't want it to destroy the faith of those around me because I didn't put God first. And if there's areas of your life today that you haven't put first, now you can stand there and be mad and ticked off and have that critical spirit and all that junk and hate me and all that. That ain't going to help you none. I have nothing to apologize to any of you or anybody anywhere for preaching what I preached this morning. I've tried to preach the truth to you in love. I'm struggling. I have areas in my life I'm not preaching something to you that I don't struggle with myself, but I know it's the truth and I want the blessing. I want the blessing. I want the fellowship. I want the fruit of putting God first. And I'm going to tell you a little something. I am enjoying some of the fruit of putting God first. I hope you will too. Now I hope today that You'll spend some time with the Lord this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow. Maybe you're driving out tomorrow. The Holy Spirit will say, hey, what about that message yesterday morning? 
Listen, if Christianity doesn't work in our hearts, it don't work nowhere. Please let it, please, I beg you in Jesus' name, put him first. Father in heaven, we come before you today. And Lord, all the grief I've ever experienced nearly, Lord, has been because I didn't put you first. I didn't consider you in what I was doing. And it's damaged me and it's hurt me. And it's hurt people that I love. It's hurt your name. God, I'm so thankful for your word to know, Lord, that if I'll put you first, every other relationship will come exactly like it should be, Lord, if I'll just put you first. Help us to do that in practical and real ways in our life. God, today I pray for these people that are here, that are listening, people that will listen, that God, maybe there is things, Lord, that they're struggling with and so forth, Lord, I didn't even address today, but oh, God, you can minister to them, their hearts. God, help us to put you first. I beg of you in Jesus' name, give us the grace to put you first. And every time we make a business decision, every time we respond to somebody, God, help us to put you first. Will this honor Christ? It's in his name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. I appreciate you being here. See you tonight.